We, we talked about that last week that in all scriptures, God breathed. It's profitable for teaching, for proof and correction, for all things that are involved in godliness. And so if we're a church that doesn't preach and teach and base our leadership and our governance and our worship on the scripture and what God tells us to do, then we're a church that doesn't need to exist. If we're not founded and rooted in the Word of God, our church is not functioning at its capacity. It's not functioning in any way that God would want us to if we're not anchored and rooted in the Word of God. Amen. Right? Because we, we found that First John tells us, or John tells us in John chapter 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we looked at this, this idea of that Greek word logos, that means the breath of the Word of God that we see in John chapter 1. That what God spoke was Jesus. What God created was through Jesus. And then He gave Jesus to us as our substitute to die in our place, to die for the sins of the world, to pay for your sin and my sin, and to save us from the wrath of Himself. And then, Jesus resurrects from the dead, ascends to heaven, where He intercedes for us at the right hand of God, and He's given us Himself in His Scripture every day. He's given us His Word as the very oracles of God in our hands. So we need to be found and rooted in the Word of God. So this week is going to be a little uncomfortable for some of us. It's uncomfortable for me because when I grew up in a very traditional Southern Baptist church. And I grew up in a family that is very rooted in traditions. My grandparents still to this day believe that you dress your best for Jesus on Sunday. And so my grandfather wears a tie every single Sunday. And that's his thing and I'm cool with it. Me, I look like a doofus in a tie. I tried to wear a suit for a wedding. And I don't ever want to see those pictures again. <laughs> like, I don't understand it. They, they fitted me at the tuxedo place ahead of time for this suit to wear this wedding. And then I got there and it looked like I was wearing football shoulder pads and one hung over my hands. Like, we're just my knuckles were hanging out the bottom. Like, just the tips of my fingers. My pants looked like you could fit like three people in them. I look like an idiot. But those are traditional things. Right? But we love as American people to hang on to our traditions. We love to hang on to our suit wearing we love to hang on to our, you know, what, whatever your church tradition is. And some traditions are great. Some traditions are rich and rooted in Scripture, and we don't need to throw those out. We need to hang on to those because they're good traditions. Right? Traditions like one we do here, where we read a benediction at the end of the sermon. That's a good tradition. Why? Because it's rooted in Scripture. It's the reading of God's Word over God's people to send them out in the world. So we need to throw out that tradition. That's a great tradition. Amen. But today we're going to tackle some stuff that's going to be hard for folks who've rooted in tradition. Because I grew up in a church where we didn't have elders, we had deacons, and only deacons, and deacons were the governing body, uh, and we had folks who served in some capacities. We just had deacons. I was 21 years old before I even realized that a deacon and an elder were different things. That there were two different roles. I never knew that. Some of you might have grown up in a church like the Methodist church that has a different structure. You might have grown up in a church that's a congregational-led church where you had 7,000 committees to vote on every single thing. Right? Some of you are like laughing because you're like, oh, I remember those days where it was like people fought with each other over the color of carpet. Uh, and you had to form a subcommittee who then had to form a secondary search committee to go to the carpet store to figure out what kind of carpet you wanted. Then you had to bring the sample back. Then you had to put that before the committee. They had to vote on the three samples and then present the one that they wanted to the congregation who then had to vote on that sample. It's harder to pass, like, it's harder to pass the color of carpet in a Baptist church than it is to pass a law in the United States government. Okay? Right. Some of you grew up Presbyterian. You had, you had a Presbyterian that was over all things, it was over all of the Presbyterian church, and none of the folks that are in that governing body went to your church body whatsoever. We all grew up with different traditions. Some of you grew up in a tradition that had a Moses and Aaron model where you had the senior pastor was a Moses and the associate pastor was an Aaron and one was in charge and one was subordinate to him and the two of those guys made decisions. Some of you grew up with a CEO as a pastor who like, everything stopped with him. What he said goes and if you didn't like it, you can get out the door. These are all things that we have we've gone through this. And so this morning, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings or, or fight with anybody. And you can take it or leave it with what we say here. We're just going to look at what Scripture teaches us about church government, church leadership. Which I know sounds super riveting. Like you were excited to come to church this morning. You got pumped up singing Break Every Chain. And then you find out we're teaching through church government. And you're like, I'm just going to take a nap. And then we'll sing again. It'll be awesome. Right? I promise you I'm going to try my best not to bore you. I'm going to try my best not to bore you. So if you got your Bibles, 
I even flip over to 1 Timothy. We're going to start the book of Acts, though, because I want to just look at something real quick. And so in Acts, we see this multiple times in Acts. So Jesus ascends. He gives the, the great commission to his people in Acts 1.8. He tells them what to do and how to do it as far as missions and outreach go. And then he leaves the 12 disciples, which they've now replaced Judas with Matthias. And they've replaced, and they've got this governing body, these 12 disciples. And he puts them in charge of the church. And the first thing they do out of the gate is they establish leadership. They set elders at each individual place. And that word elder we see in scripture a couple different times. And it's translated sometimes as elder, sometimes as overseer, and sometimes as pastor. It's three words in the Greek, and they're all interchangeable with each other. Right? Uh, the first one is presbyteros. And so that's where we get the word presbytery, which means to govern or lead. And so that's kind of the first time we see that. But in Acts, we see this. And then in Acts chapter 20, Paul tells us a little more insight. A couple other times in Acts, it just says, and the elders, and then the elders, or then the overseers. But it doesn't really tell us who they are or what they do. And in Acts chapter 20, Paul says this. Uh, if you got Bobby, you can flip over there. If not, uh, I'll get back to that. But uh, he says this in Acts chapter 20. Uh, we'll start verse 17. He says, Now for Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. When he came to him, they said, and then Paul begins to, to kind of rattle off and talk about how he came to them and how he didn't shrink back from teaching and how he's given them every good work and he's prepared them all. So he does this, and then in verse uh, number 26, he <coughs> says to them, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood for all of you, for I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourself and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. From among you, from your own selves, will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Right? So what is Paul saying here? He's giving us a little more insight to the job of the elders. He says, I'm putting you in charge because wolves are coming. As soon as I leave, as soon as I remove my authority from this building, people are coming to attack you. Even people in your own congregation, they're going to start attacking the Word of God and the way you teach it and preach it and guide your congregation with it. So be prepared, be ready. He tells us what the role of an elder is. It's the, this role of the overseer, someone who's in charge of the church to guide and govern and, and show the church, and teach the church. <coughs> but before we even dive into what the real qualifications of this elder, this person who's leading and overseeing the church body, we have to understand one important fact, and that's this. No man is in charge of God's church. He may govern and help rule and guide the church now and here, but ultimately everyone answers to God. Amen. Because Christ is the head of the church. We see this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, when he says, Christ is the head of the church, his body, and his is himself its Savior. Colossians 1, 18, Christ is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body makes bodily growth and builds itself in love. Christ is the head of the church. So every man who's ever been in any position of leadership in a church body answers to God. Right? We see this in 1 Peter, where we're told that teachers and leaders in the church are going to be judged with more strictness for what we say and do to guide God's church. We're held accountable for what happens inside of these walls and outside of these walls with the members of our church body. That's a hard thing to handle. Right? I'm, I'm a human being. I am fallible and I make mistakes, but I still am going to have to answer to God for what you do. Because I've been charged with guiding and teaching and helping you along. Does that mean I'm better or more qualified than you? No. That just means that's what God's called me to because God has called each of us to something and we all have equal jobs inside of the, the kingdom of God, but we all have different jobs inside of the kingdom of God. Right? Like There's a reason that I don't sing Break Every Chain on Sunday. That's because my vocal cords don't have the same oomph that Becky has, right? She's got a job to do. She can sing that song, and I cannot yeah. sing that song. I guarantee you it would be a disaster if I sing that song, okay? Why? Because I don't have that, like, 
booming power, right? I'm, I don't, I'm not a Dell, <laughs> right? We'll have different jobs. And yeah, and I'm a young guy, Ooh, 30 years old, which is sort of terrifying if you think about it. There's a 30 year old that you're trusting with this. <laughs> but then again, Timothy was not, a young, uh, not an old guy. Right? Timothy was a young man when he's placed in the authority and pastorship and eldership role of the church. <coughs> because the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And so he calls people to specific ministries, and he doesn't call the equipped, he equips the call. Amen. Right? We've heard that phrase thrown out in churches forever. But it's true. He equips people that he calls to the ministry of himself. And so he's called folks in this building to be elders deacons and leaders in the church. He's called some of you to run businesses. He's called some of you to be worship leaders. He's called some of you to be sound engineers. It's a fancy time for fancy title for running the soundboard. <laughs> He's called some of you. I mean, some of these jobs are just they're simple, but you need someone to do it. Right? We've got two guys back in the back who run the computer. They're teenagers. But they're here every week. They do it every week, and it's awesome. Do we have people plugging in and doing it every single week? It's good. It's beneficial. We'll have jobs to do. And so we see this, that Paul addresses the elders here, and he's, he's saying to them, hey, keep watch over the flock. We know that Christ is the head of that. And so we can see two things uh, from this, this passage in Acts before we jump into the qualifications and the job of an elder. The first thing is that there's a, there's a plurality of elders, right? He doesn't just say he talks to the elders, singular. This is good. This is a good thing for us to understand. Our church leadership should be spread out among multiple people. Why? Because when one person has all the authority and power, corruption can easily come in. Amen. Right? When one person has all the authority and power, they can wield it in however way they want. And God never intended that for His church. He intended for His church to be a functioning body. And it needs multiple parts to be a functioning body. Right? Like, if you're just a head, are you really a body? No. You need functioning things to move and do and breathe. Like, you have organs and you have appendages that do things that are necessary for the body. And so, so is the church. It needs multiple people. It needs a plurality of elders. Here at Mountain View, we've got six elders and two pastors. Right? Not one pastor, but six elders and eventually two pastors. They all have an equal vote with each other. They all are equal with one another in the meeting. So I sit around a table with six other guys. No one has more authority than the other one. Just because my name has pastor in front of it on a bulletin doesn't mean I have any more authority than the other guys. We vote unanimously. We govern unanimously. We sit together and say, hey, how, how can we do this? Here's our thought process. And so we wrestle through that. Sometimes if there's something we don't agree upon, we table it. And it either changes before the next time we talk about it, or we get in line with each other the next time we talk about it. But no one person strong arms anyone else. I mean, I've been here a year and a half, and so far, I cannot once think of any times where we like, got into a yelling, fighting match over church decisions. Because we're in unity with one another. We have a plurality. That doesn't mean we haven't discussed it. So I don't know that that's the best way to do it. And when we do that, you know what happens? We either go, that guy's right. He's right that this is the best way to do it. We should really think about this. Or we say, like, yeah, here's an idea. I don't think that one will work. And then we all say, yeah, I think the original idea is the best. We make decisions that way. It's good for unity. The second thing we see here in this one is that elders are in charge of, of guiding and helping and protecting the church. Right? They're under shepherds. God is the ultimate shepherd. He is the head. But the leadership of the church is the under shepherds. They are called to teach what accords to sound doctrine. They're called to keep the wolves out, to keep heresy out of the church, to, to stop things from coming in that would tear apart the body. Sometimes that means holding one another accountable. Man, I hope and pray that there are times if I say something from this platform that's wrong, that these others will pull me aside and say, that wasn't right, that's not scriptural, that wasn't correct. They hold me accountable to that. That's good and beneficial for the church body. That's good for you as a congregation. It protects you from, from being taught things that aren't right. And so, 1 Timothy and Titus give us these qualifications. 
So uh, both of them are, are pretty similar to one another. <coughs> Titus begins uh, Titus 1.5 by saying, This is why I, Paul, left you in Crete, that you might amend what was defective and appoint elders in every town as I directed. So each church has its own set of elders. Um, but Timothy, I think, says it, and it, it, Paul says it, Timothy, in kind of the biggest, most... Uh, easy to understand section of scripture here when it comes to leadership. And he addresses elders and then follows that with deacons. So we're going to start there. If you got your Bibles, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 1, it says this. It says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, but he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. So he gives out the qualifications of the overseer, the elder, the one who's charged with protecting and guiding and leading the church. So we're just going to walk through these, right? The first one is like the catch-all. This is the one where everything stops at this. If you can't understand all these other qualifications, if it's not clear, just go back to this one. He must be above reproach. That's kind of the catch-all. He must be above reproach. Often we, we wrestle through this, and our churches wrestle through this, with being above reproach, or what's above reproach? What does that even mean? Right, because we want our leaders to be transparent. We want our leaders to be open and raw. Right? What good is it for this congregation if I'm not willing to be transparent and say, yeah, I've got sins, I've got struggles, I've got things I'm dealing with. We want that from our leaders. We beg that from our leaders. We want our leaders to be open with what they're dealing with. We also don't want leaders who live in open and unrepentant sin. Right? We don't want that. Because that's hypocrisy. We have to realize that all of us are in the same boat here. We're all sinners. We're all in need of a Savior. And Jesus poured out His blood to save you and I. And He died for you and I. And He rose from the dead, defeating death forever. And He did that to make us all holy and righteous like He is holy. And we fall short of that over and over and over again. And leader or non-leader, it's all the same. We all deal with sin. It's Amen. just the truth of it. I've said this repeatedly. We're all hypocrites. That's the truth of the church. We need to come to that grips and understanding that we're all hypocrites. We've all dealt with things in our life. We've all got stuff that we're hypocritical on. But the difference is, is we try to repent and chase after Jesus. We pursue Christ and we pursue trying to be more like Christ. And so that's what we want. We want true and rawness from our leadership. But we don't want people who live in unrepentant sin. We don't want people who try to hide sins behind themselves. I'm honest with Everybody here, I deal with stuff, right? Like, I've told you all, I'm a very grumpy and angry person. <laughs> right? I try to be bubbly as much as I can, but anyone that spends any amount of time with me knows I get grumpy and cranky really fast. <clears throat> Anybody that went to summer camp this week can identify with that. I think <laughs> probably about 17 minutes into getting in our hotel and the room's being all messed up, they heard me say, this hotel is a dump! <laughs> And they're like, you're going to come to the beach? And I was like, I hate the beach. <laughs> sand in my shoes, sand in my pants, you get sand everywhere. You never can get the sand that it gets in your bed. I went to the beach anyway. And sure enough, we're sitting in service. And I'm sitting next to Nelly, and I do like this way. And I had sand in my hair. I took a shower, and I still had sand in my hair. Right? I'm a grumpy person. I can be raw and honest with you and share that with you. And I try to deal with that, right? I have my wife to hold me accountable to tell me, you're being grumpy. Stop it. We have that. I have my kids who can say, daddy gets mad. Nothing is more embarrassing than your children telling people, yeah, dad got so mad he threw something. It's really uplifting to your, your confidence when your children are telling people how grumpy your dad gets. And you're like, oh, please, please. Do you have to tell me? All these people, all of the things that I do when I'm mad, really? That's a pretty simple qualification. Now, I think the second thing that he's talking about here is that 
When the husband is a husband of one wife, he cares for that wife. He cares for that spouse. He lives self-sacrificially for that spouse. Right? That's what he's talking about here. The second thing is he's saying, we want, we want our elders to love their wives because they need to example marriage for the church congregation. Because marriage is a representative of Christ and the church. And so Christ loved the church by laying down his life for the church. So husbands, you should love your wives by laying your life down for them. Amen. Self-sacrificial love. That's the second thing that he's saying. I want to be honest. I'm bad at this. I'm a selfish person. I struggle with this. I don't serve my wife near like I should. Most of us don't. Most of us fall short in this capacity. But God gives grace. We try to pursue and become more like Jesus and love our spouses. Chase them down. Because here's the thing. Can I just be honest with you? My role as an overseer and a pastor in this church is not my first job and responsibility. My first job and responsibility is to love the Lord with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. And then my second responsibility is to love my wife. Amen. My third responsibility is to love my children in that order. God gave you your spouse to represent Christ in the church to give you a visual picture every single day. And then He gave you your children to show you how He cares for us. And so we've got to do those things. My ministry to this church is fourth or fifth on my list of things to do in a day. And it always will be. And it should always be. Now a lot of times, I have, I'm, I'm bad at this, a lot of times I put the church before things. I struggle with this. We want our leadership to love their families. Love their wives. Now I think scripture is clear. And the Old Testament tells us God hates divorce. But here's the thing, we get hung up on that. And we stop being reminded that God redeems divorce. God redeems broken people. Amen. He may not agree with what happened, but He redeems people out of that. He changes people. And so, yeah, does God hate divorce? Yeah. But does God love His people? Does God choose to work in people's lives despite their circumstances? Absolutely. You don't believe me? Look at some of the folks that we see in the book of Hebrews in this hall of faith. Guys like David, who had his best friend killed because he slept with his best friend's wife. Solomon. We just talked about him. He had 700 wives. There's folks in that list who repeatedly fall over and over and over again. So God redeems broken people. He does. Now, I'm sure everybody's just waiting for the moment like, is he going to say to be an elder you can be divorced or not be divorced? I think there's a qualification there and there's things that you wrestle with and there's gray areas there, but there's also good stuff there. I think there are biblical qualifications we see in Scripture for divorce, infidelity and abuse. And I think those things God allows for, and I don't know if that applies to this scenario or not, this isn't a hill I'm willing to die on, but I do think that it ultimately goes back to the first thing, which is, was that above reproach? Was that marriage and that divorce above reproach? And has God redeemed? Was the person a believer when it happened or not a believer when it happened? I think there's a lot of gray area to work through here. So I think we immediately just fall back to rule number one here was, did that scenario, was that all above reproach? Because I think there's different answers to each question. I think there's times when, when it's unavoidable, where a spouse leaves and never comes back. And they've tried to reconcile in every area. I think there are times when, yeah, both parties are definitely at fault. And so I don't think there's a clear cut and dry answer. I think it just goes back to, is this above reproach? Do they meet these other qualifications? If so, yeah, I think, I think we still have a, a calling and a purpose there. The third thing we see here is sober-minded and self-controlled. Our elders need to be of clear thought and action. No selfishness, no self-centeredness in our decisions. You can't make decisions for the body if all you think about is what you want. That's the reason it's good to have multiple folks leading your church. Because let's face it, as a 30-year-old, my decisions and wants and thoughts for what a church service would look like on Sunday morning are probably going to be different than someone who's 60. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, some we got some rock and roll folks here. I'm just saying, we got some folks here who, who I thought, oh, they're going to want some old hymns and stuff. And I, I laughed my butt off the first time that I found out that Jim Howard 
uh, Jim and Carrick go to like concerts like eight times a year, like Crowder, Toby Mac. <laughs> I was like, really? Yeah, we love David Crowder. Really? It's awesome. Right, we've got folks here, they, they love it. They love contemporary music. And we've got young folks here who are like, God, I'd love to hear some old hymns. I'd love to hear some bluegrass. Sweet. That's what we got a banjo for. It'd be great. Right, we hit all over the spectrum. Because everybody comes from a different walk and a time period and, and place and season in life. And so we have voices for all those seasons. But we need to be sober-minded, clear of thought. Now this isn't just talking about drugs and alcohol, that we need to be clear of that. That's true. And he's going to address that later on. But here I think he's mostly talking about you need to be controlling of yourself. You have to stop and put the church's wants and needs in front of your own selfish wants and needs. Amen. You have to decide, what does our church body need to grow the most? What is God calling our church to? And that be done. Which sometimes is, it, it's eye-opening for us. You know, over the past couple weeks, we've been posting stuff on our Facebook page and posing questions like, what songs do you like? What's your favorite music? And it's been eye-opening to, to realize, oh, there's areas that I am not connecting with people that I did not realize this is what they really would like to sing on Sunday morning or this is what they really like to, to see taught next. Although, um, I did post that question about what would you like to see us teach next? Uh, for all of you that said Revelation, I don't like you. <laughs> maybe someday, maybe someday we'll teach something in Revelation. I did that in student ministry about eight months ago. We, we looked through the seven churches of Revelation. So we might do that again sometime on a Sunday morning, maybe. I don't know. But... I'm not preaching to the whole book of Revelation. <laughs> people <are> crazy. <laughs> go, left, go watch Left Behind. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Don't actually watch that. <laughs> Kirk Cameron is good, but not in everything. <laughs> um, yeah, you have to sober mind of self control. The next thing that we see here is they've got to be respectable and hospitable. This is one area that I think we fall short of a lot. <laughs> When we, when we talk about eldership and leadership within the church, is that we're unapproachable. I've had people say this, man, I, it's a struggle to, to want to approach a pastor or an elder or someone in leadership of the church. I just don't know that I can relate to them. And I don't know if they'll hear or listen to me. That's a big deal. You need to be able to approach these folks. And I promise you, the folks that we have on our elder board, the folks that are in this church, they are approachable. Amen. If you reach out and talk to them, they'll talk to you. They will. They may have a hard exterior, but I promise you, they're real fluffy on the inside. Okay? <laughs> they're kind. They're nice. They're good folks. Talk to them. They value opinions of people, and they listen to you, and it's good and beneficial. It's good. But this is an area that we fall short of a lot, where pastors and elders are unapproachable. I don't ever want to be a person that people are afraid to talk to. <clears throat> I've seen this in a church capacity where the pastor stayed in his office until right before the sermon and then had like some guy acting as a security guard to walk him up front where he sat right before the service, went up and preached, and then after the service, right back to his office. I never want to be that guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't ever be that. When, it, when I, on Sunday mornings, when I get done preaching and we're finished for the day, the music comes on, and people are leaving an exit, I usually go and sit right here. Just like I talk to people. I want to be someone who engages with the congregation. I want, to, I want to be friends. I want to be relatable. I want to hang out with people. Right? I want to go do stuff on the weekends with these folks. And a couple weeks ago, we went to Fires Creek on a Sunday afternoon with a bunch of the young families in the church. And we tubed and fished and played and grilled out an exorbitant amount of meat. And when I'm talking, we had like burgers, brats, hot dogs, trout, chicken. I mean, it was like... Pounds and pounds and pounds of meat. It was fantastic. I want to be that person. I want to go hang out with people. I like to eat. I like to do fun stuff, okay? I, I know you were wondering if I have been dieting. I haven't. Um, yeah. So I, I want to be that person. I want to go hang out with people. I think that's important for our elders to be able to, to unite and, and spend time with folks. And I think that leads us into what we see Paul say next. Because when people are hospitable and they're relatable and you can understand and hang out with people, then it makes it easier for them to do what the fifth thing is, which is that they're able to teach. Here in our church, 
And our elders are all working in some kind of teaching capacity. We've got small groups that meet every week. Jim Howard leads a small group. Rel leads a small group. Bob leads a small group. Charlie and Mike are both in the same small group here on Wednesday nights, and they both uh, talk and teach in that small group as well. Um, we've got Bob does prison ministry. Rel does the men's ministry. Charlie does trail life. Right? All these guys are involved in leading groups in different capacities. And teaching doesn't necessarily mean they have to do it from the pulpit every Sunday. They're teaching folks. I think it's more important when he says teaching here, what is he he's really saying? Because these folks need to be wise. They need to know the Word of God. They need to know the Scripture. They're charged with leading the church. How can they lead the church if they don't know what the Scripture says? How can they keep out false teaching and heresy if they don't know what the Scripture says? They need to be able to do that. They need to be able to teach. And we were sent out of a church. When we came here, they laid hands on us. They sent us out. They said, we're praying for you. We want to be in your life. We want to be pushing you forward. When they sent us, that church has six elders, and each of them will preach a sermon this year. At least one. Most of them multiple times they'll preach this year. It's awesome. It's awesome to have a slew of guys who can teach. And I know that of these elders, I can call on these guys, and they'll jump up and teach. If I have an emergency, they'll jump up and teach. If I'm like, I just need a break. Go jump up and teach. We saw this play out before I, I entered into this role that I'm in now, and I was just functioning as just the student pastor. You know, my job. <laughs> I have to remind myself repeatedly. My job is the student pastor. One day I'll be just the student pastor again. Um, right? No. No. <laughs> Jim's back there saying, nope. <laughs> He's been telling me for a long time that he's praying God never sins anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm praying nobody else <laughs> um, Right? Where I would preach every four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that'll be the same capacity whenever we bring a guy in. I'll preach every four to six weeks. I think it's beneficial for that. The sixth thing we see here is that the person should not be a drunkard. That seems pretty self explanatory. If you go in on a Saturday night and you're over at Chevelle's and you look down, uh, in the restaurant and one of your elders is sitting there with like 12 empty bottles and is like hanging off of a stool. Probably not the guy you want to charge for your church. He can't function and guide himself. He can't, he's not self-controlled in that capacity. He doesn't know when to limit his intake. It's beneficial for us as a church to understand we don't want people who are abusers of narcotics and alcohol. I'm not saying, you know, like I've seen churches take this too far where they're like, we saw a picture of one of our pastors that a wedding and people in the picture had alcohol. I think we should fire him. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that. Let's not like don't throw the baby out of the bathwater here. What I am saying is, if you've got a, a leader in your church who their reaction is because most of the time when people are abusing alcohol and narcotics, it's a coping mechanism. If you've got a pastor or an elder in your church that their coping mechanism is not to pursue accountability. It's not to dive into scripture. It's not to reach out to brothers for help. It's not to seek counsel with wise people. It's to go to the bottle. That's a problem. Because they're, they're called to task. They're tasked with leading and guiding the church. And so their anchor and their foundation and their coping mechanism should be the word of God and the people of God to hold them accountable, not something else. Amen. They're putting their faith and their balancing on something that's not of God. Amen. The thinking... They're medicating with worldly things instead of Scripture itself. The next thing we see is not violent or quarrelsome. Now, this could be taken a whole lot of different ways. This could mean that if you're, uh, one of your elders is in a local bar fight, you probably shouldn't have that guy as an elder, right? Like, or, I mean, there's, there's plenty of ways you can take this, but realistically, I think what he's talking about here is from a leadership perspective, people picking fights with folks in the church. I've seen this firsthand. I've seen this firsthand. I've been part of a church where the pastor knew things about people in the church body that he didn't like, and so he preached to that perceived thing. And in a way, from the pulpit, attacked them. And that's never beneficial. That's never beneficial. We're told to preach and divide the word of truth to the whole congregation. So we want to do that. We're not here to pinpoint people's sins. If you, want to, if you know something that's a detail about someone, go to them. Have a conversation with them. It doesn't need to be attacked from up here. It doesn't need to be attacked from a leadership role. That's mishandling the role and authority that God's given you to handle people. Amen. So we don't want someone that's violent or quarrelsome. We don't want someone that picks fights with everybody. 
starts arguments. The eighth thing is, not a lover of money. Man, this is a recipe for disaster if you have a person that's a lover of money. This is why here at our church, we, we try to do the utmost levels of accountability when it comes to handling money. Right? With our tithes and offerings, we have a camera in the office. The money's counted in front of that camera. Each month, it's a different elder that does the counting, so no one ever does it at the same time. We have a secondary backup where Mike, at the end of each week, goes through all of the receipts and all of the in, uh, deposits and all that stuff and balances everything out. There's multiple passwords so that the rest of us can log on it and check Mike's work to make sure nothing happens. Everyone holds one another accountable, right? Because someone who's greedy to love our money cannot be trusted to do that, so they have no, no business. I've seen this played out in a church where the church basically went belly up and it's like, how is this happening? And they come to find out somebody was paying bills with a church card and then making up fake receipts. We've heard about this, right? People have heard about all these folks stealing money from churches. It's because there's no accountability. That's why we do it the way we do it. For accountability's sake, so that will never happen to us. And if we ever find a mistake in that process, it will be dealt with accordingly. Hallelujah. We will be accountable. The ninth thing that we see here is that he manages his household well. <clears throat> right? This is one that people don't ever want to talk about. This is another one that's got a lot of gray area. You know, well, what does it mean? Right? Titus tells us, uh, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and that his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. And then Timothy tells us, where he says uh, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? When he's talking about children and households there, I think the one that seems like a not so very, like the kind of black and white line here, it seems to be he's talking about people that live inside of the household. So this person's 30-year-old son, you know, does whatever. Or this person's daughter who's in her 30s is a prostitute. Does that mean they're disqualified from ministry? I don't think so because that person's outside of the house. I think what it seems to be talking about here is folks inside of the guise of that household. So people who are still living under that roof. Because inside of that roof, right, the parents are the head of that. It tells the scripture that children obey your parents. And it tells us, especially fathers, to control your children, to make them submissive, to teach them the word of God, to guide them in leadership. And so I think what he's talking about here is kids in the household who are running amok and going crazy. Now I don't think this is talking about like rambunctious five-year-olds who are loud in church or like my kids stand on the hoods of cars or um, pee in the bushes <laughs> <laughs> or climbing out of a claw machine at Walmart <laughs> I don't know who that happened to it certainly wasn't both of my boys at the same time <laughs> for those of you who don't know that you can find the picture on Facebook they did indeed climb inside the claw machine at Walmart talk about like a both proud and terrifying moment. <laughs> right, I don't think he's talking about that. I don't think he's talking about like rambunctious, normal children behavior. I think what he's talking about here is older kids who are not submissive, who are rebellious, who uh, argue or argumentative with their parents, who engage in activities that are illegal or get them into trouble inside, inside of their parents' authority, and they're not disciplined or handled for that. I think that's what he seems to be talking about here. Is he's talking about managing your household. He's talking about, man, like... If you're a pastor and you've got a 17 year old kid who has been repeatedly arrested for stuff, well, and I think it's more important that, man, is that person not qualified? I don't know. I don't know if they disciple their kids or not, but here's the thing I think that person should want to step away to focus on their family. Mm -hmm. Because, like we said before, my first job is not pastor elder, right? My first job is to my wife and my children. And so I would want to step away in order to manage my household. Because that has far greater consequences in the long run for what I do with my kids and my wife. It has far greater consequences on it. And those are my children. I want their eternal state to be with the Lord. I want to see those kids grow up in the admonition of the Lord and become believers and enter into eternity. I want to see that. And so that's, that's of greater importance to me than anything inside of the church body. I'd rather be at home dealing with that and pushing my kids to love the Lord than sitting in and trying to figure out a building fund. Mm -hmm. It's far more important to me. It should be far more important to anyone in that capacity. Mm -hmm. Right? So, I, I think that's what he's pointing to and talking about here is this idea that I mean, children, children, 
as an elder, you want to guide and shape and mold your children. So you should want to step away if they're out of line. Just a thought. The last thing he says is not a recent convert, and they need to be thought highly of in the community. And so, that not a recent convert, because who are these people who are in leadership to be established in understanding and know the Word of God? A recent convert is not going to know the Word of God like they should yet. And that's understandable. That's okay. Scripture tells us that that's okay. But we want our elders and overseers to know the Word of God. We want people to think highly of them. Right? The philosopher uh, and pastor uh, from Scotland, Robert Murray McShane, said, My people's greatest need is my personal holiness. We want people who are thought of highly in the community, who are seen as holy and righteous and good people. Right? We don't want elders, if they run a business, for people to be like, Yeah, that dude cheats everyone. Isn't that good quality for an elder? We don't want people, why? Because it brings shame on God's church. It ruins the reputation and the story of the gospel that can proceed from these doors if we've got folks who, the, who uh, people in the community think are non-believers, folks that act as non-believers, that do things that do not put God up high in their life. Second category of people we see in Scripture, we're going to breeze through this really fast because I took a lot of time to that first section, uh, is deacons. I think this is probably one area that if we're honest, here at this church, I think uh, the more I've read and studied through this this week, the more I've been convicted that we, we're kind of lacking in this area. Because for, before I thought we could have elders and deacons, but I think it seems to be scripturally that both are necessary for a church to function. Right? Because this is what Timothy says. He says in verse 8, Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first but then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons help. Uh, let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves uh, and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So pretty similar qualifications for a deacon. The big difference is what we see uh, in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 6, uh, we see where it's really a clear cut where elders are uh, charged with guiding the church spiritually and deacons are charged with serving. And Acts chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now in these days the disciples were increasing in number uh, and a complaint by the Hellenists, which is just Greek Jews, uh, picked out from among... Um, did I read that wrong? Right? I did, I skipped that. Let me flip over. It cut off some of my notes. I'll flip over to Acts and read it. I'd rather read it right, but screw it up. Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. It says this. Uh, he says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the day of the distribution. And the twelve summoned a full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of spirit and of wisdom, who will, uh, we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. <clears throat> and what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, a Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid hands on them. So these guys are established as elders. It seems to be that their, their sole purpose is to follow the qualifications of elders, but these guys as deacons, their sole purpose is to meet those qualifications and serve the church body. Right? Serving widows, orphans, feeding people, taking care of the daily ministries. Right? We know these guys are good character because the first two names on that list are Stephen and Philip. Stephen we see in the very next chapter, in Acts chapter 7, he preaches a sermon to the Pharisees and they get super mad at him and they stone him to death for it. So we know he's able to teach. He meets the qualifications of an elder, but he finds his role as a deacon first. Philip might be one of the coolest guys in Scripture. Because he meets an Ethiopian eunuch on the side of the road who's riding along reading the scripture. And he says, I wish someone was there to explain it to me. Philip's like, great, I'm right here. I can help you with that. He walks the guy through the scripture, points at Jesus. The guy gets saved. He baptizes him. And then it says that Philip just disappears. He teleports! <laughs> right? So the qualifications of a deacon are be like an elder and teleport. Okay? So if you think you can meet those qualifications, great. I don't know what it means when it says that, but it basically sounds like Philip baptizes him, and when it, it says when he comes out of the water, he was like whisked away. What? That sounds super cool. These guys are awesome folks, but they serve the church. 
They find their role of capacity in serving one another. In this church, we have one deacon right now. Our pastor emeritus himself, Jim Topping. He's the only deacon we have on the list. And he serves in caring capacities. Right? He's the one who, when you get a phone call because you visit the church and fill out one of those forms, that's the voice on the other end of the phone. He calls in to check how the church is doing to see how you're doing. Right? To see how you liked it, whether you didn't like it, what was going on. He checks on, on all those things. He helps guide our Sunday morning teams where they make coffee and set everything up. But here's the thing. We need more folks like this. We need more folks who want to care and be in this capacity and role. We need guys to step up and do that. Right there where it says that uh, the qualifications of a deacon, and it says their, lot, their wives likewise must be dignified and not slanderers, but sober-minded and faithful in all things. That word for wives there is actually better translated in the Greek as women. And it seems to be that later on in Acts, when it lays out a list of deacons, that there's women's names in there. Now that's not a hill I'm willing to die on and say, we, we want to have women deacons, but possibly. But Because I can tell you this, there are women in this church right now who are serving roles that are equal with that of deacons. Because there's men in the church that won't step up to fill those roles. Let's just be honest. We've got women here who are some awesome ladies. Amen. We've got some women here who kick butt. Right? They're the ones who are going to put on this women's tea here in a little bit. And they're going to serve all the ladies in the church. They're the same ones who put on the women's Bible study. They're the same ones who last Sunday when we had Father's Day whipped out like a bunch of fried chicken and coleslaw and baked beans and all that stuff and fed people. And it was great. we got folks who serve in that capacity. They're volunteering and serving at pregnancy centers and at broken shells and counseling people. We've got women who are serving roles like deacons would. Because we've got guys that aren't serving roles like deacons should. We need men to want to be these things. Like it's, it's a good thing to desire these roles. Not for your own glory, but for the glory of God above. Amen. We want to see these things played out. So that leaves us with one other thing. Right, there's the role of elders, the roles of deacon, and then there's the role of lay people in the church. Just your average church goer. You may think that your only job is to be here on Sunday morning. But that's not true. You are what drives and pushes this church. Because without you, there is no church. There is no need for elders and deacons if there is no church. You are the hands and feet of Christ outside of these walls every single day in your workplaces, in your schools, in your environments that you're around. And so, you're, matter of fact, more important to the mission of Christ than elders and deacons. And here's the thing. You may think that, yeah, we have a board of elders and they make decisions for the church, but they need you. We need you. Because how are we supposed to know how to serve and do what is best for this church body if we don't know what you want and desire and what God's calling you to? And so, that means for some of you, you need to speak up. Right? We're going through this process where we're looking for a senior pastor. And we're trying to, to be in tune with what the church needs to grow in the future. Sometimes that means that we need to be listening. We need to be listening to what you folks want. Because I don't understand every walk of life. Because I'm not every walk of life. Right? We, we brought a guy in and he was awesome. He said no to the job. And then afterwards we had people kind of say, you know... I didn't know that he was the right fit. So I think God sovereignly made that work out. Yeah. You're right, he did. He must have. That's the only way it could have been possible. Because God's in control. But here's the thing. We need you to share with us. If you see something and think, oh, I, that's, I don't think that's the right fit. Does that mean we're always going to make decisions based off of the opinions of people? No. Because if that's the case, somebody at some point would have probably like suggested techno music or... Uh, blocking out all of the windows and a big fog machine in here. Uh, and somebody would have been mad at that, right? Like, Because we all have opinions, and they all stink. I'm going to repeat that phrase again. <laughs> so we need your voice. We, the elders represent the church body, so we need your voice. And then we need to discern through that. So here's what I want to leave you with. Two things. First is, uh, we're going to take communion in just a second, but before we do that, I want to give you eight practical ways you can pray for the leadership and the guidance of our church. So if you're a note taker, here's a good chance to write this down. Number one, pray for our purity. Pray for our purity. <coughs> we know this to be true in our church. Man, our flesh, our sin nature, Satan, it attacks leadership in churches. And this is the most common place it attacks. Period. Pray 
for us to be pure. Pray for us to seek the Lord. Pray for us to honor our wives. Pray for us to be pure in our marriages. And keep our minds from wandering in places they don't need to be. Pray for your purity. The second thing is, pray for meekness. Nothing can kill the growth of a church quicker than arrogance. Pray that we be meek. Pray that we would, we would be humble in the way we deal with things. The third thing is pray for strength and diligence. But this is long and hard. Church ministry is not for the faint of heart. Do you know that the average church, it takes 18 months for a church to replace a pastor when one leaves? 18 months. We're nine months into this thing, and I think if I have to go more than three more months, I'm going to die. <laughs> right? Like, this double do thing, it will grow old on you quickly. Pray for strength and diligence. Man, it's the summer, and there are folks taking off of work and taking family vacations and all that stuff. Pray as elders that we can be diligent to do what God's commanded us to do. Fourth one, pray for wisdom and discernment. Pray for discernment. Pray that we would listen and we'd weed through what people have to say, what interviews and stuff that senior pastors have. Help us discern through that. Pray for wisdom for us so we make the wisest choices for our church to move forward with the gospel so that it's not just a church building that meets here, but that we see people all out in the community reach with the hope of the gospel. People saved, their lives changed, our whole community radically rocked and changed and wrecked by Jesus. Pray for wisdom and discernment. Pray for diligence. Pray that we would be open to reason. That's the fifth one. Pray that we would listen. And we would apply things that people are telling us. That we would reason things through our head and say, you know what? That, there's wisdom in what was just said. Pray for us to, have re, uh, to be open to reason. Number seven. Pray for selflessness. Pray that we would think for the, the good of the body of Christ and not for our own desires. Pray that we wouldn't just want... Something to happen in our church because it is what is most comfortable for us, but it is what is most beneficial for our church body. Seventh one, pray for our theology. Pray we would teach what is according to sound doctrine. Pray that we would dive into the scriptures and we would teach only what God commands us to teach and that our theology would be what the Bible demands of us. Pray we'd be wise and seek out the Lord in the scriptures. Pray as we would not fall into false teaching or heresy. Pray for our theology. And the last one is, pray for listening ears. Pray we would listen to people. Pray we would listen to the congregation. Pray we would listen to what the Lord is commanding from us. That every day we'd seek out God to tell us what to do.